So good afternoon and welcome to History of Mystery from Poe to the Present Day, hosted by Carroll County Library and sponsored by the Carroll County chapter of the Maryland Writers Association. Uh, I'm Dorothy Stoltz with the Carroll County Library and uh, we have joining us today, Dottie Wolf from the Finksburg branch. And we are delighted to be part of this program. I'd like to go over a couple of housekeeping items uh, before we introduce our special guests. Uh, for your questions and comments, please type them into the Q&A and you can find that by hovering um, uh, at the bottom of your screen and you'll see um, the Q&A icon. So type in your question there and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, also, just to let you know, we are recording today and the recording will be posted to both the Carroll County Public Library's Facebook page, as well as archived at our YouTube page. So you can go back to look at the program, share it with friends and family. And now I'd like to introduce Kelly Phillips, who is the president of the Carroll County chapter of the Maryland Writers Association. Kelly. Hello, everyone. As Dorothy said, I'm Kelly Phillips, president of the Carroll County chapter of the Maryland Writers Association, and I'm thrilled to be able to introduce Millie Mack today. Millie grew up in a mystery-loving family and channeled her love of whodunits into her writing. She is the author of the Faraday Mystery Series and recently completed her first culinary mystery for her new Irish Bistro Murder Series. She also runs a blog dark and, at darkandstormynightmysteries.com where you can read more about mysteries, Millie, and her books. Welcome, Millie. Hi, everybody. Let me just uh, share my screen here for a moment. Let's see here. There we go. Can everybody see the screen? Hello. <laughs> Are we? It's is the screen not, there? <laughs> it's not coming up just yet. Okay. Yeah. Try one more. Okay. Let's see here. All right, for what worked before, it's now telling me the screen is invalid. Let me back out, try this again. Sure. There we go. Excellent. Is it up there now? We have your screen, but not your PowerPoint. Let me see here. I'm. Technical difficulties. Bear with us here. Remember in the old days when the um, in the old days of TV, the screen used to pop up and say we're having technical difficulties. And bear with us. That's right. I think if you um, stop sharing and then when you go back in, um, I'm, what I'm getting now is a message um, stating to come back into Zoom, which is I. I I think you might have accidentally hit the uh, uh, the launch Zoom meeting again. Um, let's see. Okay, I'm going to do. The there you go. Oopsie. Okay, I'm sure she'll be here. She comes. Great. Okay, I think I'm back. Yes, yes. Now All let's set to go. All 
right, let's see here. Presentations. Should be booting up as we speak. Looking good. Okay, it's processing, opening. All right. Oh, I think you're going to need to stop Sherry going out and uh, you'll need to hit that PowerPoint um, window to refresh the sharing screen. So if you stop sharing, then start sharing again and look for your PowerPoint um, window. We should be good to go. Okay, I'm not getting a stop sharing at the bottom. It says I am screen sharing. Okay. New share. Let's see. Um, how about if I, there you go, excellent. Are we on? Yes, indeed, we can see your PowerPoint. Okay, now let me get it to be full screen. Yep. Which should be slideshow. And then to the left from the beginning, yes. Okay, how's that? Coming up, yes, perfect. All right. Thank you for waiting while we fix the technical difficulties, as Kelly said. And thank you, Kelly, for that lovely introduction. Um, my real name is actually Flo McCann, but I write under the name of uh, Millie Mac, and that was partly to honor my mom. As Kelly said, I grew up in a family that read mysteries all the time. And uh, as a result, um, I decided to honor her by uh, offering the, uh, the using a pseudonym, plus it's easier to look up if you're trying to find me. So today we're gonna to talk about the history of mysteries from Poe to the present day. And what a wonderful time of the year to, to talk about mysteries, cause you know, it's getting darker sooner and there's nothing as the uh, lights go dim to uh, pull up your favorite mystery, settle into a nice chair and read about mysteries. So how did the mystery genre get started? And one of the things I'm gonna try and do as we go through this presentation is I'm going to relate it back to Marylanders because you will find that Merlin had an incredible uh, influence on the uh, mystery genre. So how did mysteries get started? Well, they got started with one Merlin man, Poe. Yes, Edgar Allan Poe. And he is noted as the father of the detective story. Now, Poe had a lot of firsts, which if, as we go through these, you'll see that they uh, still are used today by mystery writers. He was the first to use an amateur detective to solve a mystery that the uh, police were unable to solve, something that baffled them. He was the first to use forensic evidence to help solve the crime, first to have an associate tell the tale, although his associate in the story is unnamed, um, it's actually an unnamed narrator for the, uh, uh, his mystery tales. He's the first to have the detective play fair with the reader. And this simply means that the reader has the same opportunity to solve the crime as the detective. And this is something that has come down through the ages. He was the first to feature a locked room puzzle, which was in the uh, murders of the room work. He was the first to have evidence hidden in plain sight with the uh, use of the pur purloin letter. Um, and I'll mention another one. He was the first to actually use a real crime uh, as the basis for a story, which is the murder of um, Marie Roger. He was the first to solve crimes using observations and logical deductions. And where have we heard that before when we talk about mysteries? Now there's some controversy. Our friends, the Brits on the other side of the pond like to point to Wilkie Collins and say, no, 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 it wasn't Poe, it was Wilkie Collins. Well, folks, let me give you some facts. The Poe story, Murders in the Rue Morgue, was published in 1841. Collins' book, The Moonstone, was published in 1868. Hmm, seems to me like Poe won this controversy. However, being good people and getting along very well with our cousins on the other side, what they do is they give Poe gets the credit for writing the first detective story, because his were not books, his were stories. 
And Colin gets credit as the author of the first detective novel. So that's how that, uh, that issue was solved. Now, the other question that comes up with controversy is who does Poe really belong to? A lot of states and cities like to claim Poe. Boston claims Poe because he was born there. He was born to parents um, who were in the, uh, uh, the vaudeville and was, they were actually um, at a performing in Boston and that's why uh, Boston uh, is given some credit. Richmond claims Poe because he grew up there. The woman he was about to marry at the time of his death was from there. New York claims Poe because he was an editor. Philadelphia claims Poe because he worked in the city for an extended period of time. In fact, uh, Poe had come from Philadelphia to Baltimore the week that he died. However, Baltimore really has the right to claim Poe. He lived with his aunt here. This is where he met his first wife. And as mentioned, the day he died, he was visiting his Baltimore published. And there's one more thing that gives us the right to claim Poe as our own. Where doth the body lie? Poe is buried at the Westminster Hall and Burying Grounds in downtown Baltimore. And I should stop here. I usually get a question about it. So let me, let me talk about it for a minute. For many, many, many years, we had what was known as the Poe Toaster. And we know that it ran from 19, in the 1930s and the visit stopped in 2006. They actually stopped in 1998, but then we learned that the son of the man who had been doing it uh, continued doing it until 2006. And then it stopped. In 2016, um, the Baltimore or Maryland Historical Society actually hires someone to now be the toaster. And the toaster comes on Poe's birthday, opens a bottle of cognac, takes a drink of, po of the cognac, leaves the remaining bottle for Poe, and also places three roses on the, uh, on the gravesite. And the three roses uh, represent Poe, his, uh, his first wife, and the, uh, the aunt that he lived with. And there's one other reason why we get to claim Poe. And if anybody gives you a hard time, what you do is you just give them the bird. And that's the Raven's mascot. Originally, we had three mascots. We had Edgar, Alan, and Poe. But they decided that was a little too much. So we now have uh, just the one mascot known as the full name, Edgar, Alan, Poe. So I mentioned a lot of things that Poe was the first of, but he also had a tremendous influence on two of the uh, major mystery writers of, of, of all time. And they are... Uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and Dame Agatha Christie. They both make mention and refer to the fact that um, Poe was a tremendous influence on them. In fact, in one of the Agatha Christie Poirot stories, um, she actually has Poirot where he has written a, a book about Poe. So that's how much they um, consider Poe an influence. Doyle one time said, uh, and he was referring to Poe's detective stories, uh, his stories is a root from which a whole literature has developed. Where was the detective story until Poe breathed the breath of life into it? So these two were very, very much appreciative of the work that Poe had done. Now, what did Sherlock Holmes add to the genre? Well, first and foremost, Holmes is known as an observer. And from these observations, he makes logical deductions through reasoning. Detection is not an intuition with him, but an exact science. And he uses forensic science, as did Poe. Uh, there's a, several references to the little uh, papers that uh, Sherlock has written on tobacco and fingerprints and footprints and bullets. And Sherlock was also a master of disguise. He would get into uh, areas as... Um, disguised as sailors or dock workers or um, livery drivers, you know, whatever he needed to do in order to get closer to where the crime and the uh, potential suspects were. And the reader is also introduced to the eccentricity of the detective. And we can think of Sherlock being somewhat eccentric, uh, Watson being the calming force. And of course, there's another example where Watson was the uh, the narrator of the Sherlock Holmes stories, also taken from Poe. And when Sherlock is working, there's no emotion. And of course, as we know, Sherlock was never involved with uh, women other than um, the, the one famous, famous uh, actress that was the thorn in his side, if you will. 
However, during an investigation, the detective becomes totally animated and excitable as the game is afoot. And Sherlock, of course, is uh, given the famous quote, which has guided the mystery genre for, for uh, ages and ages. And that is, how often have I said, uh, when you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. And I say that's used today. It shows up on multiple TV shows. I was watching a uh, show the other night. It's a new series from Acorn um, Television. And it's called The Queen of Mysteries. Um, a bit of an eclectic uh, show with some really interesting characters. But uh, in the very first episode, uh, while they're trying to solve the crime, they in fact have eliminated um, all of the possibilities and what remains must be the truth. And that's how they determine who actually committed the, um, committed the crime. Now, what did a Dame Agatha bring to the table? Her characters are complex. She is known for uh, her complex plots. They're very ingenious, her murders are inventive. And um, the way it's presented is the information is there, but somehow the reader often misses something that's seen by, uh, seen by the detective, either Poirot or Miss Marple. Where Poirot relies on these little gray cells, Miss Marple uh, makes comparisons to people in her village. And there's always a character in the village that is similar to some of the characters that are in the current murder. Murder is not sensationalized, no blood and gore, and she's great at deception. And I point this out um, because um, she's known for red herrings. And if you're, you're not aware, I'll give you a little background on red herrings. Yes, red herrings is a fish, and herrings are smoked, and when they are smoked, they turn red. Now, red herrings were used to train hunting dogs for fox hunting. And the young pups, what they would do is, as they trained them on the scent of the fox, they would periodically put in a red herring. And when the pup got to the point where he could uh, uh, smell the fox versus smelling the fish, then they were ready to go out on the fox hunt. So the red herring was meant to mislead, just as it does in uh, a mystery story. In, in uh, Dame Agatha's stuff, there are multiple suspects, mm -hmm. and invariably um, in, the, uh, in her plots, the suspects are often drawn together, and the detective makes the final uh, uh, re revelation of who did the crime. And the murderer in all of these books, the murderer must be brought to justice. Doesn't necessarily mean that they go before a court, but there is some sense of justice. Now I'm gonna come back from, from England for a minute and I'm gonna come closer to home and talk about Mary Roberts Reinhardt. Now she has often been called the American Agatha Christie. What's interesting about her is she published her first mystery 14 years before Agatha Christie. But I really think it's based on the fact that she wrote over 60 mysteries, seven plays, stories, travel articles, poems. So I think it's her, her entire body of work um, that gives her this distinction. Let me just grab a drink of water here. Now, Reinhardt is credited with two mystery first. First, she introduced the Had I But Known school of mystery. And I'm sure we've all read books where somewhere in the book, there's a sentence that says, had I but known when I let the mysterious stranger enter the house, and then from there, you know, the, the story goes on. And she used this in her first book, uh, was called The Circular, uh, Circular Staircase, where she introduced the Had I But Known School of Mystery. The second credit is for The Butler Did It. Now, she didn't actually use that phrase, um, but it was in her book uh, called The Door, where the, the butler, in fact, ended up being um, the person who did the, did the crime. Um, she's not quite a Merlander. She was born and lived for many years in Pennsylvania, but her husband was with the Veterans Administration and lived in Washington, was a member of the Washington uh, Literary Society. And uh, she's actually buried at Arlington Cemetery. So um, uh, there's a couple writers that are in Arlington, but she's, she's one of them. All right, now we're gonna go back across the pond and we're gonna talk about the detection club. This is something that uh, Britain had that America didn't have. 
And what the Detection Club was, was basically a social club. It's where mystery authors could get together and they had a monthly dinner. And then they would also uh, allow members to join. And when the members joined, uh, they had to go through a whole process. They would have the dinner and then they would go into a special room and people like Dorothy Sayers um, would uh, come into the room in a procession and the candidate to join the detection club would have to stand up and take this oath. And the oath is, do you promise that your detectives shall well and truly detect the crimes presented to them using those wits wits which it may please you to bestow upon them and not placing reliance on nor making use of divine revelation, feminine intuition, mumbo jumbo, jiggery pokery, coincidence or the act of God. I do. Do you solemnly swear never to conceal a vital clue, a vital clue from the readers? I do. Do you promise to observe a seemingly moderation in the use of gangs, conspiracy, death rays, ghosts, hypnotism, trapdoors, super criminals, and lunatics, and utterly and forever to forswear mysterious poisons unknown to science? I do. And will you honor the King's English? I will. And upon this, the person was allowed to become a member of the detection club. Notice the skull on Dorothy Sayers' lap. The skull was known as Eric. And he was actually carried in on a, a pillow as part of this procession. And it's also said that the members that were in the procession carried weapons. Uh, Dorothy Sayer Sayers apparently uh, had a revolver under her gowns as she uh, entered the room. Now, the rules for the Golden Age Mysteries. There was a gentleman, one of the uh, writers of the time, was uh, no, uh, named Ronald Knox. And Ronald Knox decided to put some rules together so members would know um, what a mystery novel should actually contain. Now, first of all, I've, I'm not gonna go through them all, I've highlighted a couple, a couple of them, but no lesser crime than murder will, will suffice. This is not about embezzlement, it's not about robberies, um, it's not about all the other things that sometimes appear in books. It has to be about a murder. As we've mentioned, the detective has eccentric habits, appearances, but he also has exceptional intelligence. And if we think about, again, going back to Sherlock and Agatha's uh, Parrot and Miss Marple, the intelligence uh, factor is certainly there. There must be only one detective, although the de detective can have an assistant. So one of the... Um, um, obviously, uh, Poirot had Captain Hastings, G.K. Chesterton, who uh, wrote the Father Brown series. Um, Father Brown sometimes relied on members of his parish or the uh, former um, uh, jewel thief, Flambeau. So there, but it's always the one detective. And again, we come back to the reader must have that equal opportunity for solving the mystery. And this means all the clues have to be revealed and uncovered and plainly stated. They can't be hidden. And the solution must be determined by logical, discussion, um, logical deductions and naturalistic means, not by accident. As we mentioned, no Ouija boards, no mind reading, seances, crystal gazing. These are all taboo. And one of my favorites in the rule was the fact that there can be no more no more, folks, no more than one secret passage per story. The villain must be mentioned early in the story and cannot appear only at the end when the final solution is presented. No love interest, I'll mention that because um, the, the business is to focus on the crime, not to focus on the love interest. That's not to say there may not be an interesting love interest that's kind of as a subplot, but that's not where the focus is. There must be one culprit, no matter how many murders are committed, the villain can have helpers or co-plotters, but the entire crime must rest on one person. And the guilty party must turn out to be a person who has played a somewhat prominent part in the stories. Um, I, I read a, a book recently where the murder did not occur until, and yes, it was a published book, uh, murder did not occur until chapter, I think it was chapter 22, and the uh, um, the person who did it is introduced at that time, actually is introduced like in chapter 35, and in chapter 40, we learn that they did it. So that's not playing by these, by these original rules. The other thing is there can't be any secret societies that are charged for the, for the crime. 
And the reason I bring this up is um, at the time, and now keep in mind this was the 30s, a lot of mystery stories in that period would have the crime um, there would be the suspects would be interviewed, there would be, you know, ferreting out the clues. And then suddenly at the end, you know, boy gets girl or everything is solved, the, the family is happy. And someone would say, well, who did it? And it was blamed on Chinese gangs, sometimes the mafia, but mostly Chinese gangs. And oftentimes it was a person of Chinese descent who was viewed as the culprit. Think of the, this is a period of like the Fu Manchu movies. And it, and it was unfortunate because it was giving the members, uh, folks of Chinese descent, a very bad uh, stereotype, somewhat similar to in, in this country with uh, Italian Americans who were often associated with the mafias. So they put this in and they actually had an effect um, on the books of that time because again, that eliminated this fallback on, on Chinese gangs as the reason for the crime. And according to this group, the detection club, the butler didn't uh, do it. All right, now after World War I, now keep in mind some of these, these categories overlap. So you have the detection club in the 30s and 40s, uh, but other literature is, is coming into play at the same time. After World War I, the war did have an influence, influence on American taste and literature. American soldiers were exposed when they went overseas to things they hadn't seen before, to different views of the world. When they came home, they wanted to read stories, but they didn't have the money for uh, expensive magazines. At that time, the magazines were what they referred to as slicks. They were on very you know, shiny paper and um, rather expensive. And the same thing with, uh, with novels. So along came H.L. Macon. Yes, our curmudgeon of the Sun Papers. H.L. Macon played a part in the development of mysteries. He actually is the, um, he launched the magazine known as Black Mass. This is what we call a pulp fiction magazine. These magazines were, were inexpensive, some usually between like 10 cents and a quarter. And they were printed, and the reason it's called pulp fiction is because they were printed on newspaper-like print. So in other words, very cheap printing, um, uh, and, and very inexpensive and very quick to get out. He launched the magazine with the drama critic, George Jean uh, Nathan, and they were really more interested in their, uh, they had a prestigious literary magazine called The Smart Set. But guess what? It operated at a loss. So they really launched this black, black mask magazine in order to get some uh, cash to prop up The Smart Set. They invested $600 and after only eight issues, they sold the magazine and its name for 12,500, but in fact had helped to establish the pulp fiction uh, era uh, within the magazine market. Now, <clears throat> in the magazines, in these pulp magazines, what uh, a lot of the stories concern the hard boiled detective. And the heyday for this mystery was from about the 1930s to the 1950s. That's not to say there aren't still hard boiled detective stories out there, but this was what they call the, the heyday. It was popularized by a man uh, named Carol John Daly. His name sort of been lost in history, mostly because he wrote stories as opposed to, to novels. Um, so as a result, people like Dashiell Hammett um, was you know more well known because he actually had the had the novels and of course Raymond Chandler, so John uh, Carol John Daly may have started it, but it was considered popularized by Dashiell Hammett and then refined by Raymond Chandler, and that means uh, Raymond added a little bit more class to the hard boiled detective. Now Dashiell Hammett was born in St Mary's County. Um, a lot of people don't know that, but he yes, he was born in our own St. Mary's County. He worked at the Pinkerton Detective Agency in, in Baltimore, and his stories uh, were based on his Pinkerton um, experience. Uh, in fact, um, one of his, he's probably best known for the Maltese Falcon, but many cr critics consider his best work to be a novel called The Red Harvest. And the narrator in The Red Harvest is what a uh, person he refers to as the continental opt, meaning the detective. And he works for, he's called that because he works for the Continental Detective Agency. And this whole story was, of course, based on Dashiell's experience uh, when he worked at the Pinkerton Agency. 
Now, many believe the term private eye came from the Pinkerton uh, logo, because as you can see, it's, a, it's an eye. And uh, the, it's a little hard to see, but we're above the detective agency. What it actually says um, is that um, the, we never sleep. It, so the, the idea that the detective is always on duty, they never sleep. And I should probably mention that the term private, uh, private eye was actually included in a 1930 Nancy Drew mystery, the mystery at Ly Lilac Inn. And um, Raymond Chandler also used this term in one of the dime detective um, magazine stories. So the term private eye was around uh, a little bit, but the, the credit seems to go to, to Pinkerton. The other interesting factor is that pesky little falcon, the stuff that dreams are made of, uh, still adorns a building at Baltimore and Calvert Streets. And the building at the time of uh, Dashiell Hammett working there, it was referred to as the Continental Trust Building. And that may be where his uh, name for the Continental Detective Agency uh, came from. So again, a little, a little piece of history here, here in Baltimore concerning uh, mysteries. All right, now rules for the hard-boiled detective. That's a little bit different than the, um, the more traditional mysteries of uh, Sherlock Holmes and Agatha Christie and Dorothy Sayers. The detective uh, office is usually in a seedy part of town. There's usually a lot of empty offices that are there. Um, it's not you know, a bright type of building. Think of uh, the um, buildings in some of uh, Sam, you know, Sam Spade's office and places like that. The detective appears more blue collar than white collar, although he works a lot of cases for um, the upper class. He's sometimes seen as an outsider or a rebel. Again, keep in mind that in the big sleep, uh, Marlowe used to work for the DA's office. Um, and so he's, he's not without knowledge, but he's often, you know, he got thrown out of the DA's office because he didn't agree with what they were doing. And there's often more violence in hard-boiled detective stories beyond the original crime. There's the murder, but there's usually at least one scene where the detective gets beat up um, or there's fist fights going on. Now, there may be a love interest, uh, always a woman involved, but he cannot be married. Because again, the focus has to be on the crime and not on uh, the, the love interest. Detectives appear tough, but they can crack a little bit before getting back on, tra on track. And the story ends with catching the criminal. But what makes the case close is making the right moral judgment. The detectives in a hard-boiled detective story have a very strict moral code in terms of making sure that justice is met. For instance, again, this is a spoiler alert, but I think probably most of us have seen it by now. In the Maltese Falcon, even though the love interest is Bridget O'Shaughnessy, uh, when it comes to the end, uh, there's that famous line, if you remember the movie, where Humphrey Bogart says, I'll wait for you, because it'll probably only be, I think he says, I can't remember whether it's 10 or 20 years, but he'll wait for her. But it doesn't matter. She has to go to jail for the crime that she committed, because there is that moral sense of justice. Now, when we look at different um, detective stories, um, the, the genre continues um, with lots of well-known names. I mean, dear, dear sweet Sue Grafton, um, of course, Sue, she didn't quite get to Z. She had uh, Z is for zero ready, but unfortunately left us before she was able to finish it. Um, Chester Himes, Paul Levin, John D. McDonald, Ross McDonald, uh, Walter Mosley, Sarah Priskery, Laura Lippman, Robert P. Barker, and Mickey Spillane, just to mention a few. I want to point out Chester Himes. Chester Himes is an African-American author and um, often overlooked, again, in earlier times, but he had a whole series uh, called the Harlem Detective Series, and it's, it's worth, a, a worth a look. Not only is it a period piece, um, but also the way that he uh, follows the rules for a hard-boiled detective. And again, I don't want to leave um, hard-boiled detectives until I mention our own Laura Littman, because uh, although she writes a lot of standalone uh, mystery books based a lot of times on a true crime, also uh, known for her Tess Monahan private detective series. And uh, Baltimore Blues was the first book in 1997 that introduced Tess, Tess Monahan uh, to the mystery world. 
Okay, many Pulp Fiction stories from these, uh, from the hard-boiled detective stories that were found in the Pulp Fiction magazines were turned into film noir. And uh, film noir stands, uh, is French for, for black film. The classic period for film noir was between 1940 and 1950. However, there are many later pictures um, that would fit into that, that category, such as Chinatown, LA Confidential. Um, they're much later in, in the, uh, the century, but certainly fit the film noir sort of um, uh, standard. It was uh, influenced by the German Expressionism period, uh, featuring unusual camera angles, experiments with lighting, um, its limited set designs. You know, there's not a whole lot of fancy set designs with uh, uh, on-site uh, shooting um, scenes, but dark alleys, that sort of thing. And it's uh, black and white with uh, gloomy grays on dark streets. And I think that um, this picture is sort of um, typical of what we think of when we, when we talk about film noir. Now, one of the top screenwriters for film noir was James Kane. And he was born in Annapolis, Maryland, and he died and he's buried in College Park. And along with Chandler, he's credited with refining what they refer to as the hard boiled style. He's uh, known for the Postman Rings twice, a serenade, double indemnity. By the way, double indemnity was first serialized in a pulp magazine called Liberty. Um, Mildred Pierce, the magician's wife, the Enchanted Isle. So he's uh, well known uh, as a film writer for this for this category. So what makes it film noir? Well, the leading men were all different. It might, it could very well be a hard a hard boiled detective, or it could be an ordinary citizen. Could be a star-crossed lover that gets caught up trying to save the the woman, a cowboy, policeman, boxer, uh, drifter, or in one of the well-known film noir, Sunset Boulevard, it's a writer who uh, ends up being the uh, protagonist in in the picture. Um, the women had a common characteristic in film noir. There was a sexual overturn over over tone, and this is where the term femme fatale came from. Um, it could be the way she sat on the edge of a desk, as Lauren Bacall did. Uh, it might be the way she arched an eyebrow. It might be the way she dressed, but this is what made them a femme fatale. Uh, Jane Greer and Elizabeth Scott were probably the two most famous femme, fa femme fatales from this period of time. Now, sometimes the film employs unusual techniques that adds a little bit of intrigue to the story. For instance, Lady in the, in the Lake was shot from Marlowe's point of view. And the only time you see Marlowe is if he stands in front of a mirror. Other than that, you, you don't see, you see everything from his point of view and not from other people looking at him. And DOA, uh, that's Dead on Arrival, and Sunset Boulevard were both told by dead men. As mentioned, uh, they are shot in black and white. Uh, there is a sense of, of good and evil that the entire um, uh, movie is moving towards trying to have good win out over evil. But it doesn't always come easy uh, for our hero in, in terms of um, the results. For instance, in DOA, the person is obviously going to die by the end of the movie. <clears throat> now, the audience is fine with this. They can deal with this overall sense of doom as long as there is a sense of justice when you get to the end of the, of the movie. And one other little note about film noir is the average price or average, average cost for a film noir was $100,000, um, which is probably why they didn't have elaborate sets because that was the, that was the average budget for, for a film noir. All right, our next genre we wanna talk about are cozies. And I'll mention that this is the type of uh, mystery that I write is a cozy. If, the, if you're not aware, the cover, if you wanna keep your tea hot, there's a cover that comes for the top of the teapot and this is referred to as a cozy. Or some people think it you know, refers to a lovely room with a fireplace and a big comfortable chair um, for reading and that particular corner of the room is often referred to as cozy. 
the cozies came back in uh, in the 50s um, as a way to revive the golden age. So what they generally uh, classify now is they talk about the golden age of mysteries, which is the Dorothy Sayers, the Agatha Christie's, the G.K. Chesterton's. They refer to those as traditional mysteries. And the ones that came uh, a little later in the in the 50s as the cozies. Now, that's not to say that, um, you know, Agatha Christie's and Dorothy Sayers mysteries aren't also also cozy, but that's kind of the distinction they make between the time period. And cozies tend to emphasize um, uh, puzzle solving more than um, suspense. They're called bloodless crimes, meaning that the blood and gore is not described in detail. Uh, in many cases, the body is not discovered um, by the detective. And a lot of times the murder uh, has occurred off, off scene. So you have the scene where the person discovers the body either, and immediately the detective is called in. So there's not a lot of description about the body. Just as with the original Golden Age mystery, all clues have to be presented to the reader. Again, it goes back to this, um, a good mystery has to give the reader a fair chance to solve the crime, the same as the detective. Uh, cozy sleuths tend to be very positive people and they're often humorous. There's often a bit of humor in there. Um, in their efforts to help others, they're sometimes viewed as busybodies. And I wanna come back to the fact that the emphasis is on puzzle solving versus suspense because there's another type of um, mystery genre that emphasizes suspense over the puzzle solving. And typical motives for the crime are greed, jealousy, revenge, and love. And sometimes it's uh, rooted in uh, the history of the previous generations, protecting the family name, if you will. Romance is never described in explicit details. In fact, someone once uh, mentioned that in cozy mysteries, uh, sex is just implied. I'm not quite sure what implied sex is, but anyway, the sex does not appear, uh, is not described in any sort of detail uh, in a cozy mystery. There's often a small town uh, atmosphere. It might take place in a village. And this is uh, also an important element of a cozy that it's in this small community of people. The detective has faults, but these faults are usually socially acceptable, like drinking too much coffee, asking too many questions, worrying about others, nothing that is a tremendous flaw to the, the, uh, the, the uh, good person that the detective is. And of course, uh, cozies are comfortable on days when we wanna curl up with a good book or at this time of year when it gets dark sooner. And we're not gonna be scared by the horrific details. What it is, is it's a first rate puzzle to solve. So you're offered lots of clues, lots of suspects, and then you have this opportunity to try and figure it out at the same time as the detective. All right, next category are thrillers. And thrillers are the result of the Cold War that occurred in, in the 50s into the 60s. Early entries had a military or government spy theme. However, some people say the thrillers actually began with Homer's Odyssey. He makes a perilous voyage home after the Trojan War. He has to battle all kinds of hardships trying to get home to his wife. He contends with villains such as Cyclops, one-eyed giants, sirens. In every case, um, Odyssey uses cunning instead of brute force to overcome his adversaries. And that sense of cunning uh, also comes through to today's thrillers. But that's come a little closer in time. One of the earliest thrillers in modern time is considered uh, Robert Louis Stevenson's The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, which I thought was kind of interesting that that also gets classified as a thriller. Now, modern thrillers are very, very broad. They're legal, spy, action, medical, police, high-tech, military. Um, but there are some common characteristics even within all these options for writing a modern day thriller. Suspense, remember when I mentioned the puzzle solving versus suspense? In a thriller, suspense is the critical characteristic. They're fast moving, intense, filled with character conflicts. And sometimes it's hard to know who the enemy is. Characters can be taken hostage with a demand uh, for ransom. There's plot twists, psychology, mind games going on. And sometimes even our hero is trapped with no means for escape. 
plots invo involve characters who come into conflict with each other. So sometimes you have uh, characters in conflict with each other when in fact they're both on the same side uh, trying to fight an outside voice, uh, force. And the other thing with thrillers is there isn't always a clear solution. Sometimes the reader is left hanging as to what's going to happen next. Is there, you know, almost like, is there going to be a sequel or, um, you know, where does this plot, um, plot continue on? And of course, when we talk about thrillers, we have to talk about Tom Clancy. Tom Clancy, one of Merlin's own. He was born in, uh, for, uh, in 47 at Franklin Square Hospital. That's the old hospital location in Baltimore. He grew up in the Northwood neighborhood. In 1984, he sold his first thriller, which was The Hunt for Red October. And it was published by the Naval Institute Press in Annapolis, Maryland. What's interesting there is this was not the type of um, book that they normally publish, but the, the editor for that press at the time, a woman by the name of Deb, Deb, Deborah Grosner, um, looked at it and basically went to the bosses and said, if we, do, if we don't publish this, we're missing a huge opportunity. This guy is going to be, and this book is going to be a huge success. And 17 of Clancy books uh, made it to the New York Times best, bestseller list, which is really quite a feat. Now, what did Tom Clancy add to the thriller genre? Well, first of all, he set the standard for technical and military accuracy. If you're writing a thriller that has a military uh, bent to it, um, you better make sure that your, uh, your military information is, is correct um, because there's, a, there's many people out there that know the ins and outs and will, and will call you on it if you don't have it right. His heroes are highly skilled, disciplined, and professional. So they, they have a background in the topic that's being discussed. And I find this interesting. They only lose their cool when incompetent politicians and bureaucrats interfere with what they're trying to accomplish. And of course, Clancy, like many thriller writers, tap into a world event. And from the world event, they spin an engrossing, uh, an engrossing tale. The next category is uh, police procedurals. And the defining standard of a police procedural is the attempt to accurately portray members of the law enforcement uh, community doing what they do every day, whether it's forensic science, autopsies, um, gathering evidence, whatever it is. So the police must also follow the law as they charge and process criminals. Uh, and keep in mind, if you decide to write per, uh, police procedural, the same thing with the previous thriller, if you're using military uh, information, your information must be accurate. So the way you're portraying the police department has to be the way the police department actually operates. Now, do you know a Merlin author known for a police procedural mystery? Well, there's, there's lots of writers out there, but this is one of the more famous ones that you may not be aware of. Nora Roberts. Yes, Nora Roberts, the queen of romance literature, uh, writes a series called, uh, where she features a detective. Oh, she writes it under the pseudonym J.D. Robb. Uh, and the series is called In Death, In Death, sorry. And it's about a, um, future detective Eve Dallas and her husband Rourke, and it's set in mid 21st century New York City. Very, they're very well written, needless to say, it's Nora Roberts. Um, so I, I highly recommend them if you wanna move forward into a, the new century to, to read a good police uh, story. When the books were first, first published, neither Roberts nor her publisher acknowledged that it was her as the author. She wanted to see if they would stand on her own. Similar to J.K. Rowling, when she wrote her detective uh, series, she wrote it under a pseudonym uh, because she didn't want the fame of um, Harry Potter to push that story forward. Same thing with uh, Nora Roberts. She didn't want her fame as a romance writer to have people uh, buy the book. She wanted them to stand on their own as a, as a mystery uh, book. Currently, there's 50 books, uh, not counting uh, shorter novellas in this series. So I think you would agree with me at this point that Nora Roberts has probably made it in terms of uh, writing um, a police procedural book. So Merlin, folks, so uh, in summary, Merlin had a tremendous influence uh, on, the, on the mystery genre. Uh, it started with Poe and creating the first detective story. It was enhanced by Dashiell Hammett and the, uh, the uh, 
hard-boiled detective, H. L. Mankin, uh, gave detective writers an outlet for their stories with the launch of Black Mask magazine, which lost, launched other uh, Pulp Fiction magazines. Um, and it provided a source for many of the stories that Hollywood picked up uh, and produced for the film noir era. Um, then there's the thrillers and the police, police procedurals. So the question is, what's next in the area of mystery genres? And the answer is, which Merlin, Merlander will be the next influence on the mystery genre? Perhaps it's one of you who are here with us today. So that's the end of the formal presentation. Let me stop sharing the screen and um, be happy to take um, any, any questions that anyone has. And uh, I don't see any questions in the chat, but would like to invite anyone if you'd like to open up your mic and ask a question and turn on your video if you'd like. As I see a hand, Jane, if you'd like to um, go ahead and unmute yourself and let me see if I can get you unmuted here. I just wanted to say that was an excellent presentation. Very interesting. And um, I have a few new authors that I want to check out. Well, thank you. That was, that was great. And of course, I'm a big fan of uh, um, obviously the mystery genre. I don't need this need to say that, but um, you know, one of the things I enjoy is always finding something something new to read. Um, in fact, lately I've gotten into um, uh, audio books, believe it or not. And, uh, it's, and I will say uh, there's nothing better than a English male reading a bedtime story to you <laughs> while you're listening listening to a, a mystery. So one of the things I didn't mention are, um, and it seems to be in the British market right now more than the American market, they have these very short little novella type of mystery stories. Um, one of the ones that I highly recommend is called uh, The Cherry Ham, C-H-E-R-R-I-N-G-H-A-M, cozy mystery series, but they only run about 18 chapters um, and they are only available um, they're only available at this point on audio, um, but this seems to be kind of the uh, maybe a new direction that mysteries are, are going in. So if you don't, uh, you're not 100% into reading um, and would like to listen to a story, there's a, that seems to be the new area where there's these short little books that you can listen to on audio. Thank you. Yes, would somebody else like to ask a question or make a comment? Okay, I see Joanne has asked about um, my influences on my mystery. Obviously, um, as I mentioned, my mom was a huge influence. I can remember as a, um, a, a little kid um, sitting uh, sitting in the afternoon, they used to have this thing called the one o'clock movie. And for whatever reason, a lot of them seemed to be things like Charlie Chan's and Sherlock Holmes. And I remember sitting with her and, and watching these uh, movies. And of course she was a big Agatha Christie fan. So that was the, uh, the number, number one influence. Um, but I was also an early reader of Sherlock Holmes as, as a youngster. And I think that uh, again, if you look at a Holmes or an Agatha Christie, while each story is different, they tend to follow those those rules. So I think having those basic, not that people don't, you know, believe me, uh, my series, I mentioned that there has to only be one detective if you're following the cozy rules. Well, my books don't. My books have a husband and wife team. So right there, I, I broke the rule, um, but they, they operate as one in terms of solving the mystery. So um, I just suggest that if you're interested in mysteries, just read as many as you can. Um, because there are so many options out there that they will begin to help you formulate what you would like to do. Well, while we're waiting, just to ask, uh, do you have uh, like a daily routine for writing? Uh, what, what's your approach? My approach is terrible. <laughs> um, you know, in, in writing, they refer to two kinds of writers. They refer to the pantser, meaning you write by the seat of your pants or the outliner, do you outline? I do not, um, I do not outline because I can never, um, for whatever reason, I cannot follow my own outlines. 
So here's the way, here's the way that I write. First of all, I usually come up with the murder, which I know probably makes it sound like my brain is stranger than you probably thought when you first met me. Um, but I usually have the murder in mind. And then once I have the, the murder, then I start to move out from, uh, you know, why was this person murdered? Who were the characters that would have caused this murder? Um, in both my, um, both my books are, are series. So I have a, a a, you know, a set group of characters. So usually what happens is the murder occurs and then they come and ask my husband and wife team uh, to help help solve it. So that's how the books get started. Uh, the other thing I do, which I do not recommend, <laughs> is I tend to write the chapters as they come to me. Uh, and by that, I mean is I might I might know the ending, like I know who did it. So I write that chapter, but there's like uh, chapters two through 35 missing <laughs> in between the beginning and the end. So I tend to write in, in chapters, which means that um, there can be a lot of editing because sometimes what was the second chapter becomes the fourth and the 10th becomes the eighth. So there's a lot of, lot of shifting. So um, I do not recommend my way of writing to anyone, but somehow, um, it, I do manage to, to finish a, a book at the, at the end of this madness that I go through. As far as times, I usually, um, because I do a lot of other, um, some volunteer work and things like that, I usually get that out of the way in the morning. So I actually use my afternoons for writing into the evening. So if you're looking for time frames, that's, that's my time frame. I, uh, uh, in, you were saying you, some, you write the, chapter about the murder first. That reminds me of, uh, there's Stephen Covey and a lot of those leadership uh, type um, approaches to life where they say, start with the end in mind. Uh, so so uh, I, it's, that sounds like a good approach to me. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you another little um, um, story. And that was in my first book, I had, uh, and other writers will tell you this, that you're writing your book and you're writing your book. And I knew who did it, of course, I'm, I'm the author, right? So I knew who did it and I'm writing along, writing along. And suddenly the person I thought did it wasn't working out. And I thought this, this isn't with the characters. In other words, you've heard this phrase, the characters took over. And suddenly the, the book is finished or nearing a finish and, it, and it's not working out. And it turned out that another character came into play and it just made more sense for that character um, to be the bad guy. Now, what happened, it actually worked out fine because when my editor read the, read the book, um, she wrote back and she said, I was sure it was so-and-so, but then the, something happened to that person. And she says, and then I was sure it was so-and-so, <laughs> but it ended up not to be that person. So my editor was actually, uh, you know, and this might be part of the, uh, the plotting within a mystery that you put out enough suspects that the, um, the reader is kind of, you know, following along thinking, oh, it must be this person or it must be that person. Um, so that, that worked out. The other funny story um, I always tell people with the uh, first book is I was probably three quarters of the way through the book and I had the murder and the characters are going along. And this was part of the reason why the, the, uh, the villain in the book changed is I, don't, I did not know why the murder occurred. And yes, I'm writing along, I'm writing along and um, I, I'm like, well, okay, fine. I got the murder, what, what caused it? And it turned out uh, I was reading the, the Sun Papers, and there was an article in the Sun Papers that something that occurred at the Baltimore docks, and uh, they gave me the answer, but I was, you know, a, a, a good portion through the book before I actually had come up with the reason for the murder, although I had the murder, I had these characters, they were having fun interacting with each other, but I had to come up for the, uh, with the reason, so strange things happen when you're writing. So I guess one of the other um, pieces of, of advice I would give is to continue writing. In other words, some don't don't wait for everything to be perfect before you sit down to write. Start writing because sometimes between the characters and and what you're doing, the story will take on a whole whole different uh, different shape. Well, great. Do you want to take a look at the chat? There's a yeah, couple of comments. Your ideas on the new Agatha Christie's. Okay, so this is, and I always get it backwards. Is it Hannah Sophie or Sophie Hannah? 
um, I think it's Sophie Hanna, um, has been granted permission by the uh, Christie family uh, to continue the series, or at least the Poirot, the Poirot portion of the series. And um, I think she does quite well. I think they're, I think they're in the same uh, tradition uh, of Agatha Christie, um, same concept of the many suspects. Um, so I also reckon, you know, if you want to be a little more, uh, read one of the newer ones, um, her books are, are uh, I think she does a very good job of continuing the Christie legacy. And I understand that, um, who is it? Uh, Anthony Horowitz, who has uh, wrote some of the, he's written some of the Midsummer Murder series. He's, uh, he uh, wrote some of the Poirot series. He's the guy that wrote uh, Foil's War. <clears throat> He actually came out with a book, um, oh, and I'm terrible with names, it's called The Silk Something, um, but that was a, a, a new Sherlock Holmes mystery um, where Sherlock has now retired, and he's out there, if you're familiar with Sherlock, there's always this thing about he's going to retire and do bee, bee farming, well, he's on the bee farm, and um, uh, solves a, a new crime, and I just heard where he's written, uh, apparently a, a also written a Poirot, or a takeoff on a Poirot. Not sure about that, but I just I just heard that. Yeah, I think it's the uh, the case of the silk stocking. Yeah, something, yeah. 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 But that's, it's, you, know, you know, well, Anthony Horowitz is just an excellent writer, so of course it's very, very well done. And again, keeping, you know, part of the things when you, um, when you take over a series like that, where the character's been, you know, previously established, do you maintain that character? Um, uh, here, somebody said it's called House of Silk. Um, one of the, one of the uh, things that, um, uh, what do you call it, a criticism of that book was there was a little more blood and gore. Um, you know, I guess he updated it in the sense of a little more of the um, description of the murders, which some people um, took issue with in terms of not keeping with it. But other than that, I think it was a, 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 great, a, a great book that he wrote. Okay, uh, you mentioned J.K. Rowling. Do uh, you, if you're talking about Harry Potter, of course, I think that was a huge success. Um, I mean, I'm I'm in favor of any author that can get you know what 10 million kids reading reading a book. Um, in terms of her, um, what's the guy's name? It's Stryker, is the is her detective. I'll tell you when I first picked that up, and of course she's another one who wrote it. Uh, wrote the book under, what's it, Galbraith, I think is the pseudonym she uses. She wrote it under a pseudonym to see if it would um, would hold up on its own. But of course, before, I think she had only sold a thousand copies when word got out that she had written it. And then of course it, it took off. The issue I had, and this is, you know, just having read the Harry Potter series, um, Mr. Stryker um, is not, uh, he, it's not a children's book in terms of the bad language. Let me phrase it that way. And um, you know, like in the first first chapter, there were there were so many bad words I had to like cover my ears. Um, but that's you know, again, she was trying to create this. He's very much a hard boiled detective, you know, kind of a sleazy part of town. So she she uh, certainly cr uh, created the right kind of hard boiled detective. Um, I don't think, you know, they hit anywhere near the success of her other books, but again, it's it's a good entry into the mystery into the mystery genre. Let's see. I like Lee Strauss here, Ginger Gold series and others. Yes. Uh, excellent. Um again, there are so many series um series out there in terms of the number of books being uh, you know, published especially in the mystery mystery genre. Um I mean, what's the phrase? So many books, so little time. I mean, I, I keep trying to, I'm, I have my favorites. For instance, one of my favorites is Louise Penny and her Armand Gamanche, Gamanche series. Um, and her books are so intense in the sense that there's always the literary element where she's quoting uh, poetry and other literary works, which is a subcategory. There's the subcategory to his home life. Um, and then the actual crime that the, her plots are, are, I often have to read them um, several times just for the plots, but she's, and I found her late in life. I only found her a couple of years ago. So that's one of my, um, uh, my newer ones. And then um, who else have I found recently? 
I went back um, and started reading Rita Brown. I was doing something on cats and Rita Brown has a series where the, the cats are actually involved in, in solving the crime. So I've been reading um, Rita, uh, Rita Brown um, lately, but I mean, sometimes I get, obviously I have, um, I have a Kindle um, and I, I mentioned the audio books, but I get these notices every day of, you know, today's Kindle special. And I have this bad habit of buying something. <laughs> so, um, and a lot of times it's it's an author I've never heard of, but I'm usually pleasantly uh, surprised that uh, I found somebody new to new to read. New interest in authors writing historical mysteries, Elizabethan times. Um, I have read many historical mysteries. Um, um, Historical mysteries, I'm trying to think. I should have brought my Kindle in here so I could look at it. Um, I'm actually reading um, a, another series right now. I can't think of, God, um, this is awful. I can't remember anybody's name today. Um, what is, it's done is the last name. Let me see if I can find it real quick. Um, and she writes in the 30s. And this is a case of, um, she, um, she has a title, but because at the time in Britain, uh, uh, the uh, titles did not pass the women, so it went to like a, a cousin. So she has gone out and she works as a travel writer where she goes to these uh, homes in, you know, the mansions, the estates of the um, gentry in, in uh, London and then writes a travel article. Well, unbelievably, of course, the, uh, there's always um, a murder. Um, at the at the estate, so that's kind of a fun one that I'm reading right now in terms of a uh, uh, period piece. Um, let me. I'll give a shout out for. Uh, oh gosh, let's see who else. You know, it's one of those things where you go you, when you go blank when somebody asks you a question. Uh, Elizabethan times. No, I haven't gone that far far back. Do you? Is there um, Dottie? Is there somebody in the Elizabethan times that you recommend? Not getting an answer yet. Or anybody else. Is there an Elizabethan one that you like? I lose track of, of uh, time in terms of uh, um, what period is actually Elizabethan. Well, one thing that struck me is uh, how important Baltimore and Maryland is to the mystery genre. I just love it. Yeah, people don't um, people don't realize that we we had the influence that we we had on it, and still continue to have. I mean, um, you still have Dan Festerman. He's writing uh, thrillers. You know, he's become uh, rather well known. Um, um, who's the other? John Gilstrap, um, who again is writing uh, more of the thrower type. Um, so I mean, you know. Authors just, and of course, I mentioned Laura Lippman in terms of her PI series, but she also writes standalones that usually are founded in, they're not really true crime, um, but a lot of times some actual crime has influenced her to write the particular book. And we didn't even mention the, uh, you know, the true crime category, which is another whole category. Um, and of course, her husband was known for, what is it, The Wire? Is that what, David Simon? Is that who? Yeah, I think. I think it's the wire. So, yeah, they got uh, crime interest in their family for sure. Um, well, do we have any other questions or comments? Um, I want to thank you, Flo. This was just outstanding. Uh, really, really enjoyed it. Uh, Looks like Francis is saying, I like Charles Finch and his detective, Charles Lennox. Now that series, I, I don't know. So you've just given me another series to put on my list here of uh, someone to go to go read. That's great. Oh, do you have any, any uh, final thoughts or 
anything for sort of the good of the order of wrapping it up? Well, needless to say, being a, a writer of mysteries, I hope everybody goes out and buys a mystery book or goes to their library and takes a uh, orders. Well, of course, you can't go in, but orders to uh, get a book out. Because um, I, I do think uh, for a long time, mysteries um, uh, compared to literary fiction was kind of the stepsister. You know, people said, oh, well, that's just a mystery. You know, you should be reading um, literary uh, fiction. And I remember... Um, who was it now? Uh, Sue Grafton was was interviewed, and you know she was such a good writer. The interviewer, I think, rather um, I think was trying to get her goat a little bit, and said, "Well, you know, you're such a good writer. Why are you writing mysteries and not, you know, something um, uh, in terms of of literary fiction?" And her answer was that she found, and this was her speaking, she found that. And I'm, hopefully I'm quoting this at least near to what she said, she found that literary uh, fiction um, tended to introduce people that uh, meandered through life and ended up going nowhere, <laughs> where she felt that um, she felt that a mystery, you know, had a beginning, a middle, and an end, <clears throat> and there had to be some sort of solution at the end, so she felt the progression in a mystery was more than just sort of uh, wandering through life, um, you know, as, a, as literary fiction. Um, so again, going back, I hope everybody finds at least one mystery book they can uh, read, especially now that we're into uh, uh, the, the darker period of uh, having more uh, hours in the evening that uh, lend themselves uh, to mysteries. And, and if you're a writer, keep, you know, just keep, as I mentioned, keep, keep writing and you'll, you'll be amazed how the story will, will take over and, uh, and do it, help you That's out. Great. That's great. I, I do want to say that Carroll County Library, not all libraries in Maryland, but Carroll County Library is uh, open for uh, limited, limited access. Uh, come in, get your books. Uh, we do have the computers that can be used for like an hour at a time, uh, as well as the express pickup. So um, uh, love to, to have you use the library. Um, uh, I guess a, question, a final question I have is just, can you tell us a little bit about your, your upcoming book? The, uh, the book that uh, hopefully will be out in the next two weeks, it ran into a couple formatting problems, but in the next couple of weeks um, is called Take the Spirit of Murder. And it uh, features my two uh, detectives, husband and wife detective, Carrie and Charles Faraday. And this is where a series comes into play because you introduce characters and those characters can reappear, not necessarily in every book, but they sometimes come back. So this is a case of two bookstore owners that were introduced in, uh, in book um, two uh, have come and contacted um, Carrie and Charles because their family owns a manor in the upstate portion of, of the, where they live. And the manor is now having problems. And they, some of the staff is blaming it on the paranormal, but the, the net net is it's affecting, uh, affecting business. Well, of course, Carrie and Charles no sooner get there and there's a murder. Because um, as mentioned, there has to be a murder. And then of course the, the rest of the book is um, balancing what they're seeing against what could it possibly be paranormal or is it in fact, you know, a human element. And so um, there's multiple suspects and multiple uh, events that occur until a logical conclusion is, is reached as to who's causing all this ruckus. So again, it's a it's a fun uh, fun book. As I mentioned, cozies often have a humor element, so there's a bit of uh, humor uh, humor in the book. And then the other book, which is not uh, is not out yet, is um, an Irish I call it the Irish Bistro series. takes place in a restaurant, and the restaurant has an Irish uh, background. The parents were Irish, and the young lady running that restaurant. <clears throat> of course, there's a uh, a dead body discovered in the outdoor cafe on the very first day it's opened for the spring season. And the, the gist of this one is she's worried that the um, a dead body, when you're running a restaurant and there's a hint that the person may have been poisoned will affect, you know, will affect the, uh, the business. So there always has to be a, a reason for the, uh, the person to be solving the, the crime, you know, what's the reason she's saving her business. In the case of Carrie and Charles, they're helping out uh, two friends. 
Um, so that's kind of the, the governing um, reason for getting, getting involved. Yeah, one of the great appeals to me to the mystery genre is that problem solving uh, that goes on. Um, yes. Really, really love that. Um, well, thank you, Flo, so much. This, this My was pleasure. an outstanding uh, program and uh, hope everybody enjoyed it. And uh, uh, we'll hopefully get another uh, Writers uh, Association program coming up in a couple of months. So thank thanks you. everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Okay.